Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. Look at what we have been working on here. Let's go see about this mess. This is a, this is a, uh, that's an old uh, Hank Ballard in the Midnighter song. <laughs> Let's go see about this mess. Uh, this is a 1978 Bally Kiss pinball machine. And this thing's been sitting a while, but we're fixing it up. And uh, if you didn't see, we've already filmed a couple videos. We did one where we showed what kind of shape it was in when we got it in. And then we did another one where we worked through the powertrain and we have all of the power working. All the voltages are present. It's, it's power in it. I can feel the high voltage from here. Right? But today we need to get the MPU to work. The microprocessing unit. This board up here ain't working and so the game cannot play because this board isn't working so the power comes in from the wall it goes to the power supply the rectifier board the transformer and the rectifier board and then up to the solenoid board which uh, regulates the power so we've got all of that work and we got all of our voltages that we need and we are finally we've got 12 volts over on the MPU see that little green light that LED is from 1978, and it's still trying to tell us something. <laughs> I keep saying 78. I hope this is not 79. I think it's 78. Uh, so the LED is trying to tell us what's going on with the board. Whenever it's just locked on like that, when you turn the game on, that LED comes on. It should blink and give you a code, but it's not because the CPU is not even running. Nothing's working on that board yet. That green light just means that there's 12 volts on it. So uh, we are going to fix that board up, and we'll go through what the, the flash codes mean. Um, and I can help you fix yours by watching this video. So if you have one of these, a Bally or a Stern, Stern used the same boards. So if you have a Bally or a Stern from about 1977 to about 1983 or 84, something like that, they all use this same system with the same boot-up sequence. And so, uh, you know, if you have a, a Matahari or you have an Evil Knievel and you've got, you've got a problem with the MPU, if you watch this, you should be able to fix yours. So uh, the first thing that you need to do is verify that you have voltages. So we already did that on the last two videos. That's what we've been working on, fixing our power supplies. When it started, we didn't have voltages. So uh, you can check. Test point two here should give you 12 volts. Now, if it's 13 volts, 14 volts, that's fine. You don't want it to be 5 volts, and you don't want it to be 18 volts. You don't want it to be way out of line, right? Um, uh, and uh, you also need 5 volts to, to boot the board. So you need ground, 12 volts, 5 volts. There's another one later that we'll talk about. But uh, to, get the, to get the light flashing, you need 12 volts and 5 volts, okay? Um, so we have the light on, which means we have the 12 volts. When I check test point 5 here for our, for our 5 volts that we need, I only have 4.8 volts. So I'm a little low. That's probably enough to boot it, but it's a little, it's right on the borderline. It may not boot at 4.8. Uh, but I'm going to show you why that's low. If I check it over here on the solenoid board, we have 5.0. 5.08 volts, but over here on this board, we've only got 4.8. The solenoid board is providing the 5 volts. So it's sending out 5.08, but whenever it's over here on this board, we've only got 4.8. Um, so you, you need to make sure that your, your, your uh, power is present. Ours is. 12 volts is going over to it, and 5 is going over to it. The reason that it's not 5 on the board is because this connector where the power goes in is suspect as hell on these. So if you have problems with uh, the, your voltage is low, first check over here to see if you have 12 on the solenoid board. Check if you have 5 on the solenoid board. And then check over to the MPU. If, if you're losing voltage somewhere or it's low, it could be the connector where it comes off the solenoid board over here, or it could be the connector where it goes on the MPU over there. We've already rebuilt the solenoid board and reworked the connector, but we haven't messed with the MPU yet. So the problem is likely on that connector going into the MPU. So there's nothing more we can do actually in the machine. So we're ready to go ahead and pull it out and put it on the bench. 
you can rig up a uh, test uh, um, a bench rig for this if you want. Uh, if you look in the schematics, all you need to send the board is uh, ground 12 and 5 volts on the appropriate pins of that connector. There is a solenoid voltage that you need for the final flash. So whenever this thing boots up, it has a boot sequence. And so it does a quick flash saying that it reset. This one didn't even do that. So the reset section isn't working or something, right? So we didn't even get our quick flash. It just came on and stayed on. So it does a quick flash, and then it does one blink, which means that the ROMs all work. And then it does two blinks, which is one of the RAMs. And three blinks, I think, is another RAM. We'll go over that specifically here in a minute, but we're not getting any of the blinks. So there's nothing I can really do with it in the, in the machine. If you were to rig this up on a test bench where you've got the voltages going to it, you can literally plug it in, plug the power in, and you'll watch it do the quick flash and then the seven flashes that it needs to do on the, on the bench. It'll just sit there and do it. Um, so we're not going to do that because I've got a perfectly good bench here to test it in. Nice test bed right here. Uh, but we are going to work through it. So the first thing that we need to do is pull it out and check it out on the uh, on the table and uh, We'll see what we can do about that battery and uh, How bad the corrosion is and all of that stuff So you've probably got similar problems with yours if you're watching this trying to fix up your machine I can show you how to fix that up or if you'd like You can buy a new board, but if you do buy a new MPU board you still may have the problem with the connector. The little pins in the connector get corroded and the voltage won't go on the board if those pins aren't making good contact. So, Enough of that though. Let me pull the board out. We'll put it on the, on the bench and take a look at what we're starting with. So here's the board close up. In a previous video we were showing that that appears to be a date code of the fourth week of 1986. So at some point they replaced the battery, but that point was 35 years ago. <laughs> However, there is not a lot of corrosion. There's a little bit there. See it? So we, we got pretty lucky. It's not crazy. A little bit. So we have caught it in time. We may have to replace that socket, but... little bit there. This socket is most certainly probably fine. Most certainly probably. What do you think about that? Probably fine. <laughs> um, and then sometimes it gets over here to the to this connector too, which is where the power comes in. And it has not. Everything looks cool. So this is actually pretty clean. Um, we um, we got out pretty lucky on this. So when the battery starts rotting, it rots this section first. And this is the reset section, which is what gives you that first flick, which we don't have. So something is damaged here, or the, um, I believe it needs the CPU for the first flick. I think it needs this PIA for the first flick. Um, and I think it I think it needs it needs one of these ROMs for the first flick. So if you look at this ROM, look how dirty the legs are. See how you can see a line that looks clean? Okay, so I'm gonna push it back down. Oh, it, didn't, it didn't go back down, but basically the part that's exposed gets tarnish on it. And then it moves a little bit, and you you move whenever it moves, the metal pin is no longer touching clean metal. Now it's touching tarnished metal, and it just if you lose one leg to where it can't electrically conduct through it, it can't read through that leg or whatever, then that ROM doesn't work. And so if that ROM doesn't work, the whole board doesn't work. So it could be dirty pins on the chip. It could be a bad socket where the socket is physically worn out, where it, it doesn't touch the legs very well that it's supposed to hold. Or it could be the, the socket so dirty that even if it touches the leg, electricity can't pass through the dirt. 
Um, so it could be anything like that. Or it could be corrosion. Like it, th this socket's right in the way of the corrosion. So it, um, sometimes you have corrosion under the socket that you can't even see. And the corrosion will actually break legs or infiltrate the leg to where it's there's um, it can't send electricity through it or whatever. It can't conduct. And then sometimes it could just be that like one of these transistors has died. There's three of them. This one, this one, and this one. So if anything in this reset section doesn't work right, not counting that chip, this stuff and this. If anything in there doesn't work right, you won't get that first flick that you need. If the legs on the CPU chip are corroded to where they're not making good contact, like these are, you won't get that first flick. So, what are we going to do to service it? Well, the first thing I always do is you cut the battery off, and then you see if you can clean up the corrosion simply. So, what I, a lot of times what I'll do is sand it with, like, really fine sandpaper, nothing crazy, just to get some of the corrosion off. Um, I've had people say, oh, you can use flux and all that. I'm sure you can use flux. I can use sandpaper, right? So we're going to clean it up, and then we're going to put a little vinegar on it to kind of uh, stabilize it. Um, and uh, once we get that all clean, the, then we can check our transistors and see if they're good, see if there's any resistors that look damaged that need replaced. Um, there's a couple diodes here, I think, a couple caps, you know, but this one's in pretty good shape. So I think the flicker problem is probably the legs on the, on the, uh, the, the ROM chips and the CPU and all that. So we're going to clean this up and then we're going to re-solder the connection on all of the connectors. So basically just adds a little more solder to the back of each pin to make sure that they, we don't have any broken solder. Uh, and then we're going to carefully remove each chip, clean the legs off, and put them back in the socket. And then we're going to try it again and see what kind of flashes we get. Now, let's see if there's any broken solder joints on the on the uh, on the uh, pins here. That looks pretty good. It's always the ones on the end. Those look decent. Those look like somebody might have messed with them before, but they look decent. I don't see any obviously cracked ones. Yeah, everything looks pretty good. So once again, I mean, it's a pretty decent board. Um, the board, all the boards in the back back box look pretty decent. So it's the machine has a lot of wear on the play field and a lot of wear on the cabinet, but and it, the, the electronically, it's in pretty decent shape, even though it doesn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna take the battery off and we'll see what kind of rot we run into. All right, so here is the 6800 chip. This is the CPU. So without this, ain't nothing going to work. So this is how it is in the socket. You see what I'm saying? That's pretty much all tarnished. And so I cleaned it off, and that's how it looks after you clean it off. So the way I do it is I use a needle file. This isn't like a real harsh file, though. It's about worn out. And this is the same file we use whenever we do um, EM contacts. So you clean it up, get it looking good. I've heard people say that you might be able to use like a chemical on it. You may be able to. I haven't ever tried that. But you, you have to clean the outside and the inside of all the legs. Right? And then here's the socket. Now there is different opinions on these different sockets. It kind of depends on the type. You know, some of them are better than others. Some people don't like these at all. Uh, some people say they're fine, but I, this type, I usually don't have any trouble with. But the problem is, is that just depending on how they're made, down inside of here there are two little leafs that grab each switch, each uh, pin. So when you push it down in there, it slides between those little leafs. 
But if the socket's a crappy one, those will spread apart to where when you put this, the leg down in there, it's not touching anything. So, so we got to clean all that up. We cleaned up the damage. They're really, I wouldn't even really consider it damage. I don't know. I mean, it was some discoloration on stuff. But there was nothing that it looked like it had been eating up or gnawing on. So I think we got out pretty light on this. See the little bit of discoloration inside of the traces there where it's black? That's not perfect, but all in all, we're looking pretty good. We've got the source of the, of the problem off. The battery's gone. And then we're going to neutralize this with a little bit of vinegar just to get it where it, uh, if that's... Um, a base because it's alkaline we'll put a little vinegar on it which is an acid and hopefully that'll neutralize it and then we'll take the vinegar and wipe that wash that off too so um, that's what our that's what our plan is let me go get the phone so we're getting them nice and cleaned off it kind of depends on how, what the the pins are made of if they're uh, coated in tin I guess they don't tarnish um, I might have that wrong, but so look at this one. This is an interesting one. You can see where where it was in the socket is completely clean, but where it was out of the socket is tarnished completely black. So that one probably wasn't an issue, but you know if it moves a little bit, maybe it would have been. So we're just gonna clean them all, put them all back, and then see what we got. So here's something you run into all the time on these. This thing had really black legs. It was all screwed up. And so while I was messing with it, it was the last chip too. I broke one of the legs off. And they, they just get real fragile to where the legs easily break. And you'll notice that some of the chips are worse about it than others. Um, so we broke that leg. Now sometimes you can solder another leg on. All right. See how this says 9316A? That's the type of chip. It's a prom. So uh, there may be new old stock ones that you can burn of this, but you can you can put a 2716 or a 2732 in the board. But sometimes, I don't know about this particular one. You may just be able to put a 2716 in. But sometimes you have to change these jumpers to replace the the chip with something else. See where it says... E14 and E13A, right? And then this says E8 and E7, and they're connected by a jumper that's been soldered in. And then this says E2 and E6, and there's a little jumper. There's there's these jumpers all over the board doing this. E9, E10, 11. What it's doing is it's sending the address uh, lines uh, to different parts of the uh, to the socket, so that you can put different chips in it. These sockets here, to the best of my knowledge, weren't used on any of the games. But they just designed it where there could be more sockets, and depending on how those jumpers are set, it could these chips over here could uh, enable the the, the uh, ROMs and all of that, right? So anyway, my point is, to replace this one chip, I can't burn another PROM, because I don't have any of the PROMs, so I would have to put it on like a 2716 or something. And uh, there is a list online where you can see what all the ROM, the jumper settings need to be. A 2716 may just go right in there without any changes. But, 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 if you have worked on a ton of these, then if you break the leg, I'm not too worried about it. Because I have the exact same prom that I took off another one a long time ago. So I always save them. <laughs> okay, now, you may have the problem where the prom is bad, where it has forgotten some of its info, but I don't usually find that to be the case. Usually they're fine. You may wonder why a lot of times we don't even check the ROMs. It's because, knock on wood, usually that's not the problem. Every once in a while you get a ROM that's bad, it's dropped a bit or something, I don't know what you would call it. But in general, ROMs don't go bad that often. And a PROM, usually you don't have trouble with. Sometimes you do, you know. 
and there's exceptions and I've certainly replaced them before but you don't always have to replace them so if, if the things are are in good shape the legs aren't breaking off everything's clean nothing wrong with having the original proms in it so uh, I'm gonna clean this one up and pop it in there if you notice the, they look a little different but the part number is exactly the same E746-11 U1 E746-11 U1 this one was made the 24th week of 1979. This one was made the 35th week of 1979. Just stamped a little bit different. Okay, so I'll clean that one up and put it back in there. And then I'm going to get the vinegar so we can uh, put a little vinegar on here. Okay, folks. So I took an old toothbrush. Look at that. Would you brush your teeth with that? Ugh and my vinegar. You can tell it's vinegar because it says vinegar on the side of it in somebody's handwriting. And so since that's base, like I said, we you just brush it with a little bit of vinegar. That'll help neutralize it, hopefully. And you're right. And so now you got vinegar all over the board, so you got to get that off. So I took some water and a wet paper towel and took that off. Now normally it's up higher, so you have to get everything stuff, but since it was just this, it was pretty easy to dry up. And then on the back, we did the same in that little area there with the vinegar and down along here with the vinegar and then wiped it back down to get the vinegar off. So hopefully that'll keep it from creeping. This corrosion has a habit of creeping. Okay, so what have we done? I reflowed the connectors with new solder. Okay, I cleaned the pins of the connectors with a small file just to clean them up. Now you could replace them all too if you want. Uh, I cleaned up the corrosion with light sandpaper right to where I could not see corrosion anymore and I checked very carefully under the socket doesn't look like there was any corrosion under the socket it was just starting to creep then we put vinegar on it then we cleaned the vinegar off with water so that the vinegar didn't stay on there okay then I took each chip out and cleaned the legs and put it back in very carefully um, and that's all we got to do. And I checked these three transistors too, and they all check fine with a multimeter. Uh, from base to collector, base to emitter, we're getting 0.4 to 0.7 um, uh, on the meter. So it it seems like they're fine, but who knows? On these, usually, unless something is damaged by the corrosion, none of this re usually needs replaced, right? So there, the one little minor area of interest is this resistor gets kind of hot. And so it will discolor this resistor above it, but it usually doesn't actually change the value of the resistor. So you may have a situation where this resistor is a little off color like that one is. It's just slightly discolored, but it's still test fine. So we could, we could replace a bunch of this, but it's all decent original stuff. So next step, we're going to slide it in the machine and see if it works. Oh, you know what? I need to put the battery on it. I didn't think about that. <laughs> Let's do the battery. Almost forgot. Now you got a couple different ways you can do this. All right. There are about five ways you can do this. One way is you could solder uh, the original style battery back on it and then just be careful and not leave the damn thing on there for 35 years and it probably wouldn't leak. <laughs> right? That's an option. People really don't like that option though whenever I bring that up. Another thing you could do is you could replace uh, this chip, this RAM chip, which is a 6810. They make another one that you pop in there that doesn't need a battery. Non-volatile RAM. I don't have one right now or I would do that. But you slide it in there, and then you never need a battery again. That's the Cadillac option. Okay. Another thing you can do is you could just not put a battery on it at all, because the board will boot fine without a battery. It just won't save the high scores. So if you buy one of these, and it's got one of these on it, and you're worried about it, just cut the damn thing off. It'll still play. But what will happen is when the game comes up, it will have trash sometimes in the high score. So what that means is... When the game boots up, the first two digits say zero because it's there's no score. 
and then the then it'll blink off and, and flash and show the high score. Well, since that doesn't have a battery to back it up, it will save, uh, sometimes it'll just get loaded with weird stuff. So it might say blank three, blank five, four, one. And that's the high score because there's just trash saved in the, the thing. And that might change every time you boot it up. But it doesn't matter, right? And as soon as you get a high score, it'll probably override it and it'll be fine until you turn the machine off and back on. So you don't even need a battery. Now there are some of the games uh, later on, the Bally's, that they had settings in the test menu. So you would lose those settings. So the settings um, on all of them have the three high score thresholds. So where do you win a free game? You know, you can set it at, um, you know, at 150,000 points, you win a free game. Well, that gets reset if the battery isn't in it, if you don't have a battery hooked up. So that would be different. But on some of the games, they have like option 15 is to turn uh, the background sound on stuff like that. So you, on some of the later games, later we're talking after 1980 or so, there's some settings in the menu with stuff like that on it. But you do not need a battery. So you could leave the battery off. That's one option. You could replace it with the same type of battery. That's a second option. You could put the non-volatile RAM chip in here uh, so you don't have to ever have a battery again. That's a third option. You can install a supercapacitor. So this is a supercapacitor, they call it. This charges up, so the board usually charges this battery. But this charges up, and it's a capacitor, so it doesn't leak alkaline. Um, the problem with these is, if you don't play the game for a couple weeks, it may drain out to where there's no uh, voltage left in it, and it doesn't save the settings. And so after a couple weeks, things would reset if you let it sit for a while without playing it. You have to turn it on every once in a while to recharge the capacitor up. But that's a pro that's an issue. You can also solder a wire to here and a wire to here and then run it way off the board and remotely mount a battery. Either one like this or you could use AA batteries and a battery holder. Right? If you do use a, a AA battery or something like that, those aren't designed to be recharged. So you have to put a blocking diode in the wire so that the board, when it's on, can't send power to the battery. So you just need a diode with the banded side towards the board, the positive side of the board. right? Um, I'll show you that here in a minute to make more sense. So you can do that too. We used to do that all the time, but what we've been doing lately is putting button cells on it. A little cleaner, and I think it's easier for people to change. Um, I don't know that there's uh, that they'll last as long as double A's, but they don't leak either. So, so um, on one of these, the positive side of the battery is this edge here, and the negative side of the battery is that flat part. So we want to put the negative lead where the negative lead of the other battery was, and make sure that's got a nice solder connection. Bam. Well, then we got a problem where we don't have a hole for the lead to go through. So you can drill a little hole in the board for that lead to stick through. Once the lead sticks through, say right there, you can run a jumper over to where the positive side of the original battery was. Well, we need a blocking diode because we don't want that to recharge, so that's a good place to use a diode as a jumper. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to drill a little hole in the board so that this can mount and then we're going to put a diode in between it and the positive side. So I'll show you how that turns out. Okay, so I drilled a little hole in it. Be careful when you do that that you don't drill through this trace here or this trace here. <laughs> drilled a little hole in it and I put a, a diode. This is a 1N 4004. Just a uh, blocking diode. Swing so uses a blocking diode. So basically this is the positive side and the negative side is here. So basically the board can't send power back because it hits the banded side of the diode. So it can't, power cannot go this way to charge the battery, but power can still go that way. Right. Mounted a little battery holder on it. And I always write the date on it just for the giggles so they can get the same joy that we got when we found this old one. Now, here's what we do. Here's what we do. I looked it up. The chip needs like 
it's something like two volts or something to hold the, the uh, to retain the information. So we're going to check from ground to this positive. We have 3.0 volts off of a 3 volt battery. So we're good, right? So that's working as intended. But it would be interesting to see if the original one is still working as intended. Let's see if I can do it with one hand. Original battery. Well, it's not original, but it's from 1986. Still has 3.5 volts in it. It was just fine. Why'd you have me change this battery, Joe? I don't know. We didn't have to do that. It would have leaked all over the board, people. 35 years is a good run. But yeah, some of these some of these ones were uh, legit. <laughs> That's a legit battery right there. So this one's not as big, so I, d I doubt it will last 35 years. But whenever, it's, whenever it stops working, I can just pop another one in there. Easy peasy. Okay, so we're ready to put this back in the machine and uh, see what happens. Okay, so we've installed it back in and we're going to test it. Now, uh, what we're looking for, two things. We want to see if the display fuse is going to blow. <laughs> Did we already do that? I can't remember. It's been two days. Um, and we want to watch this LED to see if it uh, does its boot up sequence. Now there is a particular boot sequence. We're going to see if we get a quick flash and then seven full flashes. So here we go. Quick flash. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow, it came right back. Wow, it's got the lights twinkling and all of that stuff too. Okay, hmm. And I plugged in one of the displays just so we could see. Seems like that's doing its thing. I don't know how long this thing hasn't been working, but it's now back up and semi-working. But it, it didn't play the little tune, so the soundboard's not working right. And other things. So I'm going to show you, uh, since we're doing this about the MPU board, and if you look, it's hard to see, but the, the LED kind of goes dim. So it does seven flashes and then it kind of dims. So it's, it's on right now, but it's, just, it's real dim. So that's kind of what you want. You saw the real quick flash and then seven distinct flashes so I think what I'll do is I'll replay that section and I'll show you what each flash means so if you're working on one uh, and yours is doing anything at all um, you'll be able to, to, to check it out now if it's just stuck on like we were saying before that basically means that you have 12 volts there so you know you got your 12 volts or something close to 12 volts but it means that uh, the reset is not working and the, the game is basically not running any code. It's not doing anything. So it could be the CPU, it could be the PIA down at the bottom here, the bottom one. Uh, it could be the ROM chips, and it could be the reset section. You need all of that to kind of get that first flash. So uh, I'll replay it, and as each flash goes on, I'll tell you what that flash means. Now when the flash happens, it means that it has checked, a, it has done a test, and it's passed. So the one that checks the 5101 RAM, for instance, when that flashes, that means the 5101 RAM is fine. So each each flash basically means that that uh, that test has passed. Whenever the seventh flash happens, that means that the solenoid voltage is fine and the zero crossing detector is working. Uh, um, is that, the, that what they call it? Zero crossing detector. Anyway, we'll get into it. So um, I'll I'll write on the screen here what each one of the uh, flashes means in case you are trying to uh, repair yours and need some help with the flash test.
All right, so hopefully that'll help you if you've got one. Now, it doesn't have to be a Bally Kiss. This is the MPU dash, I think they call it the 35, the Bally 35 MPU. That flash sequence is the same on pretty much all the Bally's, all of them, and all of the Sterns. All the early Bally's, all the early Sterns, up till about 83 or 84, or something like that. Uh, the only one that's any different is uh, Bally's Baby Pac-Man and I think Granny and the Gators. Um, they only have six flashes. They don't do seven. So their, their flash sequence is a little bit different, but that the flashes mean the same thing pretty much uh, on any of the games because it's just the like basically the BIOS part of the ROM um, doing some tests right when it comes up. So this one's coming right along. What do you think, Joe? Is it coming right along? Yeah. See? <laughs> um, here in a second, I think it swaps over to the, all the pop bumper caps start doing their thing. Or maybe it already did that. But anyway, um, so we've still got a lot left to do, though. We still need to work on the displays. We need to work on the soundboard. We need to work on the lamp board. We need to completely disassemble the play field, clean it all, and put it back together. We need to work on the flippers. We need to replace all the light bulbs. We need to clean all the switches, and we need to collect, check all the solenoids, and then we need to clean the cabinet up a little bit, too. So, uh, we still got a little bit more work left to do. But, this will be a good stopping point here. We pretty much got the MPU back doing its thing, and finally got the thing to boot up. Very cool. So, leave your comments below. Let us know what you think. Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you. We didn't have to do that. We're going to have a special guest uh, repair person come in on one of our videos here. You'll see him soon, so stay tuned. And we'd like to thank everybody that's been using our Amazon links. If you don't know about that, down below there is a link to Amazon. Different ones too, depending on what country you live in. And uh, if you're going to buy anything on Amazon, if you click our link before you go to Amazon, then it says that we sent you there, because we did, and uh, we get a tip for sending you there. So thank you to everybody that's been doing that. Also check out our website, lionsarcade.com. We have all of our games and uh, machines that we have available for sale right now up on there. It's always up to date. And the uh, we have a parts page where we sell some of our uh, uh, merchandise. So we've got like a new t-shirt design that just came out with a new logo and all of that uh, for, for you that uh, like our repair videos. It's kind of repair oriented. <laughs> um, we had a new logo design. It looks like kind of like an 80s thing too. So it's kind of cool. We like it a lot. How do you like your new shirt, Joe? I like it a lot. See? See what I'm saying? He likes it a lot. Uh, so make sure to check that out, lionsarcade.com. And finally, last but not least, check out our brother channel, My Brother Donnie. The link is down below. It's literally My Brother Donnie. If you like watching us work on these old pinball machines, you may enjoy watching Donnie and I work on some old buildings. We're trying to repair some old buildings that we bought in the downtown area of a small town near here, trying to help revitalize downtown. So go check that out. I'm over there with them most of the time. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Kiss.